Hello, my friends. Katie Day with the Movement of Texas team here with another episode of the Real Advice Podcast. I am excited to dig in with this week's guest and welcome him to the podcast with over two decades of experience in the real estate industry. He currently leads a large team in Canada that was recently named the number one team with our brokerage. He's a keynote speaker, a real estate coach, and a mentor across North America. Please join me in welcoming Darren Langeal from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. That is me. You know a few of us up here in Calgary, <laughs> don't you? Which is maybe rare for, for, for the way the real estate industry goes. It's right? um, it's funny. So you know Jesse Peters, right? Mm -hmm. Over over in uh, Winnipeg. Yep, yeah. the Peg. Um, and so whenever he does a keynote, he always starts off by like asking people if they know where he's from, and then he pops up a map of where he's from. And so I feel like with, you know, some friends in Toronto and, and Winnipeg and, and uh, Calgary and, and all over Alberta, like I'm starting to learn, uh, you know, like the province and city stuff, right? And like things like that. And so I thought that it was just kind of Americans that ha were terrible at geography. But then like sometimes then when you start quizzing Canadians, they're like, oh, yeah, I have no idea where that is. Like I know what's south of us and that's it. Yeah. Um, so it's funny. Geography, geography is funny. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm hoping to, to get up there maybe this year. Um, I talked to Brad about it, right. Cause he's, he always tells us how great, like, you know, Alberta as a whole is. So it's a pretty place to be. You might as well come, you know? Yeah. 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 Just, just like during the summer, like not, yeah. not anytime soon right now, just, just in the summer. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, we have, we have, you guys only just have to learn a few provinces, right? It's not that hard, guys. But we have to learn a whole bunch. You guys just are just a giant puzzle. So, but we do learn about you guys in, in school. Uh, but memory may not be the thing that hold we hold to do well. So. Yeah, school, school. You know, it gets further and further away every year that passes. You're like, ah, oh, that's that's long gone. Too 100%. many, too many other things in your brain. <laughs> All right. Bit. So, for those that may not know you, how did you get into real estate? Oh, wow. Good one. Um, I was an engineer out of school, uh, mechanical engineer, somewhat good at math. So figured that was the path. <laughs> yeah. And grew up in northern Alberta, which is where oil sands country is. So that's, okay. you know, a lot of engineers. So that was the thing. Did engineering. But uh, I got into real estate because I ran into some dude when I was in my fifth year university that was a real estate investor. Okay. And I would just see him at a restaurant constantly every day while I was serving. He would with, with a new person and he was like locked in, like yeah. super passionate. And he turned out to be a real estate investor, prior engineer. Okay. And I was like, tell me, you know, show me the wisdom. So I, yeah. I got hooked on real estate, bought a few properties while I was in university back when it was a little easier with financing back in those days. <laughs> yeah. And then um, moved, to, moved to Calgary where I am now and transitioned into real estate full time with the thought to be an investor, live off cash flow. Yeah. You get your license to make a few bucks when you do that, right? Yep. You know, yep. why not? And uh, it turned out those were early days of Facebook. Mm -hmm. I was sharing my journey just randomly. And then when I look back, it was hilarious. But people started to say, well, can you help me sell your house too? Or help my, yeah. can you help me buy a house? And I just all of a sudden ended up being a realtor and quite liked it. So we transitioned out of real uh, out of engineering and, and went into real estate full time. And that would have been in 2008. Um, my business partner and I kind of went from investor to full time realtors to starting our brokerage in 2009. Well, and so how long were you in like the engineering world? Uh, like not long. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> like one year. Yeah. Okay. Oh, four, I graduated, took my first gig, moved down to Calgary. Yeah. Kind of like technical sales role that allowed me to build my portfolio on the side and like property manage these things. And I was keeping up with like guys in their 40s and 50s with sales quotas. But if you're a young guy full of piss and vinegar in your 20s, you, you're going to outsell those guys in doing it half the time. Yeah. So I was able to like do this real estate thing on the side until I said, well, I might as well go full time. So That's interesting. And so you still have a property management like business today, right? We do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so as far as kind of building out, you know, do you still work with a lot of investors as well? Has that been something that's grown as your, as your business has grown? Yeah. So the, my business partner who I'm 50, 50 with ever since 2005, we're still 50, 50 partners. He's always been a little bit more in love with that world. 
So okay. he took and continued to take the lead with investor focused mm -hmm. uh, agents. And so we've groomed up about a dozen of our agents to kind of love that part of it. So he kind of coaches and mentors and, and drives that side of the business. Personally, I just took the agent coaching, agent marketing strategy, and I and I developed that skill set over the years with my my yeah. years in Tom Ferry and all those stuff. Not really conducive to investment property real estate. So that was kind of that became my path, and Brett took the other path, and we still use it as a core. Like to be honest, most of my net worth is real estate driven. Uh, and not commission driven. It's it's real estate acquisitions and and, and cash flow and now development, and uh, I love it. That's that, that's the thing that we still do beyond all of what you and I do every day. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's interesting. What advice would you give to someone if they were? I guess let me rewind and kind of kind of lay the lay the groundwork for this question. So a lot of times when you see people that are partners in business, right, or people that start a team together, they mm -hmm. are, you know, you and I are in the same office and, and we're both talking and and maybe I have a slightly better split than you or you have a slightly better split than me. And we say, hey, let's team up. And like if if we both go under your split or mine, we both get a better deal and we can say we're a team. And and that's how I feel how at least maybe old school, mm -hmm. a lot of teams have been born, right? Um, looking back on it now, right. And, and having, I mean, you said 2009, 2008, like having many years of experience now of, of being in a partnership with someone that, you know, ha has worked out, like what advice would you give to someone if they were looking to kind of like start that partnership team situation Yeah, that like, you know, you would, you would impart wisdom, you would impart. <laughs> yeah. So we partnered up in 05. Um, and maybe we're different than most, but we went all in with everything from day one. Okay. So what that meant is as we built our property management, as we bought our real estate holdings, as we flipped homes, as we did sales commissions, it was 50, 50 on all things. Okay. And, and that's not easy for a lot of people, especially if you're coming from two different places and yeah. different experience levels. Um, but I think this philosophy still that I'll share still ranks true. If you're going to choose the partnership, I think it has to, you have to have the true intention and both people have to understand what this is for and for why. Right. So in our case, we were looking long-term. Yeah. So it didn't matter if I sold 400,000 and he sold a hundred thousand, our money was split. It didn't, didn't matter if I landed a hundred management clients and he landed zero we were we were extending this together it was the journey that we were 50 50 on not just the present month or the quarterly results it was much longer and that's allowed us to like really like not hold entitlement as partners to say oh yeah. i deserve more or you deserve less yeah. and and we've never done that we've also um i guess you know when you're when, when you're that financially tied it's it's a it's harder to break up Right. Which means you have to just act almost like a married couple in the sense. It's just like the moment him and I ever had any issue, our, our thing between us is surface it. Do not let it fester. Do not let it boil. And we would just tackle stuff like man to man as soon as it came up so that we didn't build resentment because there was there's two decades worth of resentment that could have been built. Yeah. You know what I mean? So maybe that's no, for sure. That, that, that was going to be that was going to be my follow up question is I was like in, in almost 20 years of, of being business partners, like what's the what's the secret? And I think that that's it. Right. Of like, hey, if there is something we need to talk about it sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Right. And and I mean, as you know, exactly like in the Tom Ferry world, in the coaching world, like there, I, I built the biggest part of my business through the rise of teams. And it was like, go bigger, big mega. And it was like, everybody was coaching to that. And it crushed a lot of people because you ended up building things you didn't really even want to own. So if you're thinking of team, you got to really decide like, what is it you truly want? Is this just to look bigger on public? Do I want that brochure to look a little fancier because I got this team behind me? Or is there truly some value that you're going to build on this? And if that's the case, well, that's, you have to make a longer decision. You got to commit harder. Yeah. And, and and probably intertwine more things, I would think. Well, and in my experience, you know, on the having the bigger team, the the larger the team, generally speaking, the the lower the profit is, right? And so at a certain point, you just have to have more and more agents, right? Because you're you're making less per person, mm -hmm. um, you know, because you're spending more money when you have twenty or thirty or forty or or eighty people, right? Oh man, I at our peak 
team, when I ran the team as a team-based brokerage of Redline, there was 12 of us. And we were selling about a home a day. It was the typical 50-50 model. And to be honest, I was never more filled with anxiety and worry than that because I had a sixty or $70,000 monthly burn rate to run that team. Yep. I needed the team members to sell in order to get anywhere near break even slash profit. And I think so many that, that doesn't get coached, right? That yeah. almost ends up as this like shitty result. You're like, do I even want to own this team? And that's what allowed me to eventually shut the team down in 16. It was all doing the right things, but I just was stressed. I would have rather been a solo agent, you know, just crushing half a million dollars versus running a team doing a million and a half. Like it just, it, it was it was tough. What would be like the, because I mean, I, I think that something like that's like hard to wind down, yeah. right? Like, you know, from from just a logistic standpoint, but then also an ego standpoint, right? Um, real estate agents, you know, we sometimes have a little bit of ego, right? Yeah. Um, not not you or I, I'm just saying in general, right? Oh, I've had ego. I've had ego. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, same. But um, <laughs> What would be like if you were if you were diagnosing right of like okay you know is is continuing down this path the right path or should you perhaps not have a team anymore what would mm -hmm. be something questions that you would internally ask yourself or that if you were coaching someone right that you would you would go down what kind of path would you go down with them I mean I I do coach some leaders some team leaders some growing team leaders and I try to pull from my experience as much as I can right yeah. not from like. And I guess I, if you're going to be in a leader posi position, you need to like ask yourself the question is like, could you do this body of work that's needed to drive the business forward independent of the short term results? Because, you know, you coach your agents, you, you, you bring on buyers agents, you train them up. And it's like if you're expecting that quick, immediate result. And you feel like I'm only going to coach this hard if they show up. I'm only going to coach this hard if they fill out their accountability. I'm only going to do this. You have to extend the timeline longer because it will take longer. And if you start to question to say, I don't want this journey, right? I'm not willing to lead as hard as you require because to charge 50-50, to get that back is an honor, right? 50-50 is not a small chunk. So if you are you have to lead hard enough, give enough value to expect somebody to do that and not grow entitlement against you. So if that doesn't feel like your journey, you, you may want to change. You may adjust to say, well, what if you put that effort into your business and sure it's not all scalable. Maybe you're yeah. not sending every lead out, but you're happier and you're like, I can just control me and I, I'm closer to the results. That's probably what most of us should be doing, to be honest, rather than growing the teams that we probably felt we were told we should build. Well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully a bunch of people listening to this right now aren't, uh, you know, completely reevaluating their lives. So let's switch gears a little bit. Um, but no, I, I think that that's great advice. And I think that um, it's, it, it's difficult sometimes to figure out exactly what that looks like, right? Because as, as we go to events, and as we go to things, right, you hear about these organizations that are that are doing crazy things or, or awesome things, right? Um, but yeah, you got to figure out exactly what what I can tell What's you real? when I was on the panel at real about team leadership and team yeah. leadership mastery. And it was before they announced that we got number one. I didn't really <laughs> know. And I, I got asked at the very end, what would you, you know, would you do it again? And I said, no. And I mean, I think that's heavy, but you know, where we are now today is further ahead than I ever thought I would be ever. Yeah. I, this was never on the roadmap. Yeah. And I'm super grateful for it. But would I go through the 10 years to get here now? I don't think I would have. Um, and I tell my own agents, as much as I love this where we're at, that's that's it's tough, right? It's yeah. tough, right? So there's there's a lot of paths to this. And the big numbers don't always mean uh, it's the it's the path for you. There's so many awesome ways to build this business. Yeah, for sure. Well, and, and it sounds like you y'all have a lot of different pillars, right? Not just real estate brokerage, but also, you know, property management and mm -hmm. investments and development and all these things. So it sounds like you've, you've really diversified over the years um, so that it's not just your, you know, your one thing. Um, as far as like in today's market, um, you know, I don't know how, how like year over year for, for your market, are y'all down 
No, like we're not. We're like the more only place. We're going up. Okay. Which is rare. We were the only place going down for like half a decade, <laughs> like 2015 to basically COVID. We were going down where the rest of the world was going up. Yeah. Um, now we're going up while everybody else is adjusting. Interesting. Um, so I'm in that I'm in that wave right now. So it's frothy. It's busy. Buyer demand is high. Inventory is incredibly low. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Well, so I guess. I mean, you coach agents across the the continent, right? Mm -hmm. And and you're in conversation with agents across the continent. So, like, what would be in a, in a market right now where in most markets is down, right? What would be some things that you would coach on as far as like the things that I should be doing on a regular basis? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you've probably read the book Gary Keller Shift. Hey, have you read that one? I have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so Bill Pipes gave me that book in two thousand. 16 because we were the ones shifting yeah <laughs> he's like <laughs> dusting this book off that nobody yeah. had looked at and uh so i i i used it and continue to use it um so if you don't have that book it's very relevant to today still um i would go down that path but uh, when i think of the shift and things are are 30 40 percent down in sales uh, and i from what i understand inventory is pretty low as well is that right still it's like you know for the most part across the country, it's still lowish, right? Like I, in my market personally, like we're, we're almost back to pre pandemic levels, but like, I mean, it's still lower than it should be for where yeah. interest rates and all the things are. So yeah. I, mean, I think the first thing is there's a mindset shift that has to happen, right? Because what, once you did this amount of effort to get X dollars, now yeah. it's this much effort times 50% to get same dollars. Yeah. So you got to just like, you got to like level up and be like, that's just the reality today. And I, yeah. I think a lot of agents are still in that middle zone. They're like, they don't believe that's truly what's needed. So I think we have to shift our mentality. So if you're tracking your numbers, tracking your digits, it, it comes down to everything. The amount of listing appointments that you take, or sorry, conversations you have to generate okay. even an appointment will yeah. be higher. The amount of appointments you have that actually turn out to be a client will be lower. The amount of deals you put on paper, more are going to fall through than ever before. So again, it does trickle down through all of those leading and lagging indicators. Yeah. So as long as you feel that, I mean, I think also people, the consumer, the consumer right now is worried, right? They're like, you know, there's not a lot of optimism, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to find the stories among the headlines to share or else we're just noise like everything else. Yeah. I, in your market, there'll be a community that's outperforming others, right? In your market, there'll be a property style that's doing better than the rest. Uh, in your market, there'll be homes that have sold faster than most of the average. And if you're an agent sussing out those hyper local messages and then being the messenger forward, that's how you start to get people to say, oh, maybe now's the time to sell or maybe now's the time to buy because you're communicating the hyper local message not just anything macro because the macro is probably looking horrible right <laughs> yeah. right so, so yeah. stuff that out does that make sense where it's like no, find, it those, find those highlight moments and then just uh build i'll give you one example this this gal caroline came out of like a labat brewing selling business and she was a sales rep in her 20s she came into our market which is like yours shifted not great and she's like, what do I do? So we would do this hottest communities, hottest price ranges message on my market update all the time. Yeah. And I told her the only reason I do this is to give you guys the target points to where do you, where do you go talk to homeowners? Yeah. And she picked one of the communities that was like days on market where half everywhere else. And she just went and hit the streets. And then yeah. as like this 26 year old gal with no experience, she built out an email list in this one community of like 130 people instantly was starting to become high market share yeah versus these farm marketers the bus benchers the guys that sprayed and pray in their mailbox she just cut through all of that noise like butter right yeah and she built it and she was it was amazing right so those high those hot hot button opportunities you just got to dig harder does that make sense yeah and so so you mentioned it a little bit right as far as like creating market updates or creating things to where you're where you're showing this right like okay hey i found this days on market are slower uh, or or shorter excuse me or hey here's a neighborhood where you know while we're only seeing x percent this one's seeing you know y percent which is better right 
uh, higher, higher uh, year over year values and things like that. Right. Like, so what are you doing? Are you highlighting those via market updates? Then you said, you know, she, she's one who went door knocking to tell people about kind of what's happening with the market. What are things that you would do from like that content perspective or from that, you know, one-to-one perspective to, to get that message out to more people? Yeah. I mean, it gets harder when the market's like this, when you have to yeah. go hyper local, as you can imagine doing educational content to the masses in your community, you know, like, like a typical agent would right now, you're going to be following on deaf ears for most people, right? Yeah. Cause like 95, 96% of people are not in consideration that are going to hear your message. So if you're going only macro to a large audience, you're going to have a hard time in a tough market because they're like, screw them. They're just trying to get a commission check. Yeah. So I think you have to go harder one to one, like you said, like, in, so Caroline would take that message to the front door. She would take that message that nobody's hearing to the front door, host every open house she could for anybody who would let her in the community. Yeah. Because then she could speak, well, I always say max relevancy, right? We want a place where you're, you're speaking the most like timely and relevant message we can. Yeah. And that's like, that has to be boots on the ground because we can only hyper target socially so tight, unfortunately, with the housing acts and stuff that I think you have to go play old school a little bit to get down to those micro people that may want to hear your message. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I think that the the combination of, you know, kind of the new school and old school stuff, right, to to kind of marry the two, because um, it's it's no longer, as you said, just like, hey, I'm going to send out a mailer and and then you're going to list your home. Right. You you yeah. have to have some kind of new school uh, twist to those things, um, whether it's, you know, somehow targeting them on on, you know, social or online um, video ads or, you know, QR codes or whatever it may be. Or like, right? again, our, our buddies in YouTube land, which are just, I mean, that's, that's searchable. And right, you could be playing into that. Did you know that XYZ community is, is selling blah, 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 record space or 50% yeah. faster than everywhere else in Houston? Do you think that might show up when you're targeting and tagging 100%, right? And then you yeah. could speak the right message to the broader audience. Yeah. Well, and, and one thing that we found too in this market, especially is like most of the listing opportunities that we're getting are life changes, right? The divorce, mm -hmm. the marriages, the, you know, deaths, births, things like that, uh, graduations, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and so when we look back at all of the listing opportunities we got over the year, right, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's one of those major things. Like people aren't just like, oh, I, I'd like a new house today, so I'm going to sell. So love it. Well, yeah, you're, you nailed it, right? The data is hard to find this, but the amount of people in every market, even in the shifts that want to make a change because they have life transitions and births yeah. and all this, it doesn't change. Yeah. When the sales go down, it's just the same amount of life happens. Yeah. <laughs> right. That never changes despite up and down. So the, the hope and the need is just our job is to pull that out somehow. Yeah. But it's so buried within people's minds when it's pessimistic. That we need to like find a way to just surface that and like Sharon would say dog whistle it somehow, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I was talking earlier about Sharon and like how he has like a framework for everything. Yeah. I'm like, he just takes like the most like outlandish concepts and it's like, well, this is the you know, outlandish framework that yeah. you know it's just a quick three-step process. You're like, oh wow, that that's so simple when you say it. So 100 percent uh, I mean, I well, think the other thing too, with a with a shifted market, if something wins, if you win somewhere, yeah the path of least resistance to shake that tree out for another piece of business is right there in that moment. Right. So again, back to a little more, but it's like, versus when I've said this too many times, you walk you, in the good markets, you could have walked backwards into a Starbucks and landed in a real estate conversation. Like it was yeah. that easy. Everybody wanted to talk real estate. Nobody wants to talk it now. So if you have a win and you, you had it in one of those communities and you get that listing and then you succeed with it, I would say that there is no more relevant and more important place to be than right back into that community, right back sharing it and getting that compounding value. But yet we get transactional. We just move to the next lead in some other random community. Let's go back there and monetize it. Boom, 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 boom. And you can shake the tree. But yeah, so many agents, especially in the good times, we just had enough of these other leads that were warm yeah. that we would chase and we would we would dot our way around the city. But now, why not go back 
there locally and then see if you can shake it again. Yeah. Well, and, and we know that, uh, that when someone sells their home, there's other people that are in the neighborhood that are watching that, right. And yeah. seeing what you're doing and seeing the marketing and seeing all the different things. And, you know, they may come to you or they may go to something else. Right. And so if you send out, you know, the postcard or do the door knocking or, or do the ad or do the, whatever it may yeah. be, right. That may be the thing that, that then causes them to raise their hand and come to you over, you know, someone else. So. Well, it's, I mean, human nature is funny, right? We need proof. Yeah. Right. If I want to hire you, I got to, I got to prove, you know, what you're doing. Right. And that's what we do constantly with our content. And, but when you prove success in a down market, that's even better. Yeah. Right. So even finding contextual ways to just sold, just listed, but yeah. in a, in a, in a story tale, in a bad market, we forget how impactful that is to anybody listening. Yeah. You're like, I thought things were shit and somehow Katie <laughs> just pulled this off. Right. Well, yeah. Katie's going to be the call rather than the person that, you know, didn't have buried, the buried their head in the sand. That was, that was the big thing of like Hermosi's thing of like, you know, the eyes are on you. Right. And so if you can, if you can do the business and do the deals in today's market that, you know, when, when the market has shifted or when the market is in a different place, mm -hmm. um, you know, those people will all be coming to you. So don't stop, you know, marketing and doing the things. Um, all right. I, you mentioned, you know, shift is a book. Um, I know that you are in constant, you know, personal development and, and reading things and listening to things and doing that, um, you know, and, and challenging yourself. Um, what would be some things that you would recommend either like on the book front or podcast front or, or something like that on, on personal development that you'd recommend someone read or listen to? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a good one. I think in these times too, we have to control ourselves really well. Right. We I mean, what is it, Darren Hardy that says the, or even, yeah, I think it was Darren Hardy that speaks about the winners in this market are going to be those that control their attention. Right. So controlling your attention and keeping your blinders on probably means less about instant gratification and more about compounding efforts and things like yeah. back old books that I would reread are like the compound effect. Yeah. Right. Um, where the one that you can't see behind me is uh, Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. And it's all about drifting versus the driven the drifters kind of go away from their plan yeah the driven don't they stay the course they achieve the bigger things and i think that's important for us right now i mean most of us know what we need to do we're just not doing it so i would go back to that concept i've actually reread more books than new books recently yeah you know what i mean and like i think hermosi says he's like i don't pick up a book without intention to know what I'm looking to get out of it. And then I read it and then I implement, right? So I think For most sure. of the agents, so I mean that, but this Napoleon Hill book, man, has me like, has me hard right now. Cause I, I'm trying to stay on the path. I'm trying not to get distracted, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? No, I, I think that, um, especially for realtors, like we get that shiny object syndrome, right? And like, you know, you mentioned something, I'm like, oh, I'm going to do that too. You know, or you say that this worked for you. I'm like, oh, I'm going to scrap my entire marketing plan that we've been doing, you know, that, that's been working to, to try this thing that Darren's doing, you know? And so yeah. um, keeping that in mind, right? Of just like the the things that you need to focus on are the actions, right? And and just staying on that path um, and, and focusing in on that is is so important, especially now, I think more than ever. Big time. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to hit you with one last question uh -oh. that may, you know, hopefully it won't stump you, but we'll see. If it was your last meal on earth, what would you be eating? Oh, wow. That's a good one. You know, I probably pretty, maybe you've heard this one before, but probably like lobster. That's right. where I would go. I'm up here in Canada. We're landlocked where I'm at. There's nothing better. I would put grass fed butter on it though. So okay. Would, That's yeah. a very specific, you know, yeah. I, I like it. That's good. <laughs> you're, you're a health nut. So I think you'd uh, appreciate that. So no, that sounds, that sounds great. That sounds great. <laughs> cool. Well, I so appreciate you. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to chat today. If someone doesn't already follow you on social, where is the best place for them to find you? I do most of my playing on Instagram. So if you just went at Darren Langell, the way it's spelled or the way you see it or the way she captions it, wherever you're putting this, um, that's the best place. And I'm pretty present on it.